I got a little something something I want to watch. This is a game I'm looking forward to. I've played through the first game a few times. And uh, I'm going to play through it again before the second one, this one, is released. But uh, I haven't watched this video. It's a trickster vocation. It's a vocation that didn't exist in... Like, it's like a class for an RPG game. So this is a vocation that didn't really exist in the first game. In the first game, you kind of had like warrior, mage, archer, and then you can combine those three in different ways. So you can have like a magic warrior, magic archer, or, you know, whatever. Um, so this trickster one looks really interesting and looks really cool. So I'm gonna, let's, uh, let's have a little look-see. Oh, wait, sorry, that was, that was so loud. Dragon's Dogma 2 offers a wide variety of playstyles depending on what vocation you select. Interesting. Most of these are the kinds of archetypes that you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Melee sword fighter, speedy dagger wielding thief, yeah. ranged archer, and spell slinging mage. So that's kind of like the first, the first like game. Mystic spear hand and magic archer. That combine cool. elements of one vocation with another for a completely new style of play. But what of the trickster vocation? It was revealed. Yeah, those classes in the beginning, those are like the classes you could play basically in the in the first game as well. Uh, the spear, I don't remember if you could do like a specific spear vocation, but I think it's just like warrior, uh, and you use a spear. I don't quite remember. Um, but yeah, the, those are basically the classes we kind of seen in the first one, but they seem to have improved upon it, um, uh, in Dra Dragon's Dogma 2, so that, that's super awesome and exciting. I have this game on my wish list. Fuck yeah, let's go. I, I absolutely have it too. It looks amazing. And the first one is amazing, and I, I love the first one. It's really a, like a sleeper game, like, uh, in the way that... People sleep on it. Because I don't think a lot of people have seen it, uh, played it, or know about it. But it's, like... I think it's up there with, like, the Dark Souls and stuff like that. I think it's an amazing game. Like, it's not as good as Dark Souls, but... You know, it's up there. Um, but anyway. So let's see this new trickster vocation. Oh, by the way, also... I, uh, in the first game I played a uh, pure mage, because you can basically cast a, a big fucking tornado, you can summon uh, meteors from the sky, and all that kind of crazy cool shit, which like, I feel like typically game developers in games don't allow you to do that cool shit, because it's like, oh, it's too, too much, like, it's too powerful, it's too, like, it's too much for, like, one character. I say fuck that. Let the player be fucking badass. Revealed as part of the Dragon's Dogma 2 showcase back in November. Alright, let's see. But little has been shown of this unique class beyond that quick 45 second look and a short yeah. description on the Dragon's Dogma 2 website. Fortunately, as part of our visit to Capcom, we got to sit down and play with the trickster for about an hour. So you kind of have this, like, uh, uh, what is it? Like Sage or like, um... When you have like um you you light uh herbs to get like the kind of smoke thing in like you use in meditation and stuff like that. So I'm guessing like maybe the trickster will use that kind of lantern thing as like uh hallucinogens or something like that, maybe. And I can that would be kind of cool. That this is a style of gameplay unlike like anything I've ever seen in open world action game. Amazing. Trickster vocation. To start, the trickster is essentially a pacifist. Their chosen oh. weapon, a ceremonial sensor, does little to no damage when it's swung at an enemy. Instead, the purpose okay. of attacking is to build up aggro and pull an enemy's attention towards you. To that end, you also have a special ability called Suffocating Shroud that sends out your smoke in a wide area and draws a large amount of enemy attention towards you. That's so, cool. the question is, why would you want to get a whole group of enemies swarming on you if you can't actually damage them? Uh yeah, because, uh, I mean, it's a support class, it feels like. You're, you're definitely, like, supporting your team. You're distracting them, you're 
uh, tanking for them with your, like, smoke creatures, allies, or whatever. Um, but I wonder if it would be... I mean, some people like to play support, I suppose, but I feel like if you can't do anything by yourself, you have to have a teammate all the time and rely on their damage, uh, especially when it's, like, relying on NPCs to attack and do damage. <laughs> I feel like that could kind of get wonky and could be annoying. Uh, but maybe there's more to this class. I I'm not sure. Ah, see, that's where the word trickster comes into play. By using the trickster's unique skill, Effigil Incense, you create a simulacra, or a clone, for simplicity's sake, mm -hmm. that enemies will perceive as the real you. This clone has its own health bar and will disappear if it's killed, but you can also teleport the clone to you while it's still alive with the press of a button. This way, you can basically kite enemies to wherever you want as long as you keep their aggro and keep your clone alive. Okay. So, you can maneuver a foe to get an environmental advantage, which is super important uh... because the trickster shines the brightest when there are cliffs, uneven surfaces, or other elements of the environment that can be used to your advantage. The trickster. Oh, I see. Okay, that's kind of cool. I mean, once again, I feel like it would be kind of be a little annoying because you always have to... Like, to balance the class out with the other ones who can just do things on their own, I feel like you would have to always have environmental ways of uh, killing your enemies in each area, kinda. Whether it be a cliff or, like, uh, drowning in water or uh, traps in dungeons and stuff like that. Um... But then again, I guess it depends also, because if you have, if the NPCs in the game are very well done and they work very well together with your, your character, um, then maybe it's fine either way. Maybe the NPCs will do so well for themselves, like helping you and doing damage, that playing a support is perfectly uh, like valid. In this game. That that would be really cool to see. Like really good like uh, NPC and like AI movement and stuff like that. Sir has two abilities designed around creating surfaces that aren't really there, but appear real to enemies. The first, Ooh, a wall. Terrace, creates a cloud that can be placed off a ledge oh, that the enemy that's will perceive cool. as real solid ground. And the second, elusive divider, will create a wall of smoke that you can see through. Okay, that's fucking not. dope. The final that's piece awesome. Of this puzzle is the visitant aura. I thought I thought you all, uh, you only uh, you only could really create like, uh, like other a cloner yourself, like a simulacrum or or like uh, other creatures maybe to, uh, sort of kind of fear the enemies in some ways. If you can create actually like environment, and make the enemy believe that there is environment, now that that could be very useful. It's kind of like the if you play Illusion Wizard in uh, Dungeons and Dragons, pretty much. And even in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, if you get enough, uh, if you get high enough level as an Illusion Wizard, you can weave like shadow magic into your illusions, making them real for like a, a, a period of time. Um, so so maybe if you could do something like that with a trickster, that would be even more badass. Like, imagine creating, like, a, like an illusion of a, of a stone platform above something, and then you can, like, make it real, and it just falls on them. <laughs> actually allows you to make an astral projection that you can freely move around to scout the landscape for as long as your stamina will Ah, nice. Allow. That's You're interesting. You're super vulnerable while controlling the projection, so using elusive divider to give yourself like some astral cover projection. while using it in the heat of battle is a good idea. Crucially, you can float off ledges, ascend or descend That's nice. at will, very much support clash, like use it for scouting and is. taunting sure and stuff like that. why that might be useful. When you combine all of these tricks together, the real value of the trickster comes into view. Mm -hmm. Before getting into a combat encounter, you can create a clone with effigial incense, use visitant aura to scout out an area for enemies and look for any sort of environmental hazards, like a cliff for instance, Recall your clone so that it hovers oh. over said environmental hazard. Oh, right. You can also scout ahead and terrace, look for traps and stuff like that that you can the lure the enemies into. Shroud to like, lure them into their, their own traps. The clone, and then watch with glee <laughs> as enemies throw okay, that's actually funny. <laughs> you see the enemy jump off the cliff. <laughs> 
That's great. That's amazing. Boy, now, the level designer must have made, like, a, a shit ton of cliffs in this game in specifically for this class. Which is why the Trickster is also equipped with some other tricks up their sleeves. First and foremost, they are a support class, relying on and substantially buffing the strength of their pawn party so that they can do most of the Oh, that's lifting. nice. One so it's not just illusions. Which supercharges your party, making them hit a lot harder. Okay. While I was playing for gameplay capture reasons, I had to make a mental note... That, uh, that helped me, or that helped, like, explain, or rather rectify, uh, why you would want to place just a support class that can't really do damage directly. If you can, if the NPCs are good enough and you can even boost the NPCs, like, a lot with damage and stuff like that, then, then that kind of makes up for it. I think that's really cool not to use this buff because my pawns would kill all of my foes before I got a chance to show off any of the more technical tricks of the vocation. The most powerful spell I saw of the tricksters was Dragon's Delusion, which takes some time to cast, but brings forth an illusion of a dragon that terrifies any enemy oh, that sees it, dude. even large ogres, bringing them down to their knees. That's fucking badass. That's awesome. That's, that's kind of what I said before, like, if, if summon a creature that can, like, uh, fear the enemy, that would be, like, a real nice ability, and they do have it. In fact, it's a fucking dragon. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Cast, but brings forth an illusion of a dragon that terrifies any enemy that sees it. Even Holy large ogres, shit, that's bringing badass. Bringing down to their knees, giving your pawns ample opportunity to do big damage. Since most of the tricksters, I mean, if I, I'm not gonna play a trickster myself, because I I want to play like a a mage or a mage warrior in a way, uh, one of the two. Um, because that's always what I play in these games, because I think it's the most fun. But I absolutely will like have one of the pawns be a trickster. It seems amazing to have in your party at the very least. Other skills seemed well suited for dealing with small to mid-sized enemies. This was a really nice addition to see as something that can also let them deal with the bigger and badder enemies. That's cool. The trickster was not an easy vocation to figure out in just an hour. I can time. imagine. It took me a little while to fully grasp the aggro system, avoiding pulling too much aggro and I feel, I feel like this class probably has a, a high like mastery ceiling in a way. Because it's like, you gotta be smart with your abilities. Like, it's not just go and hit the enemy. Like, you gotta really take the environment into account and, like, figure out um, how to use your abilities effectively to, you know, get the enemies to do what you want them to do. And that can be difficult. Not but it's also very rewarding if you but once succeed. Clicked, I found it to be a uniquely satisfying vocation that brought to mind one of the core tenets of Devil May Cry's combat. It's not just about killing every enemy in the room, but how you kill every enemy. Yeah, in the room. It's an intentionally get that SS rating. That's designed to encourage creative thinking to solve difficult combat problems in ways beyond just swinging a weapon or hurling a tornado at it. And it's one or that maybe I'm very you can even get a triple S in, in uh, Devil May Cry. I don't quite game. remember. Thanks for watching, and this is just the beginning of our IGN first coverage of Dragon's Dogma 2. In case you missed it, make sure to check out our 18 minutes of gameplay, covering four- Damn, that's badass. That's awesome. Okay, really cool vocation, but probably not a vocation I would play myself. But definitely one I would want to have in my party. And if you can play multiplayer in this game, which you couldn't in the first one, which, you know, makes sense. Yeah, it was a single player game. Um, but if you can do play two players in this game, like have one uh, one of your friends be the trickster vacation, like that would be so awesome to play together and try to combine like how you do um, like the combos you can do. I think that would be really cool to see. But I, I don't think, I don't know if it will be, and I don't think it will. I think it might be closer to what the first game was. Uh, so probably you would have to have one of the pawns do it. But yeah, that's interesting. Now that you watch all the way towards the end, that means you love me. Right? Right? Okay. That's good. Well, thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.